Welcome to this last session of the 27th IBA conference. Um, this session is on bear ecology and behavior. Um, Emre Khan from Turkey was originally scheduled to moderate, but uh, unfortunately he is dealing with a, a back injury um, and could not make it for his presentation yesterday or moderating today. So uh, I'll take over today. Uh, we wish him a, a speedy recovery. First of all, I would like to recognize uh, the sponsor of this session, which is uh, MPG Ranch that is uh, near Missoula in uh, Montana. And that ranch promotes conservation through restoration, research, education, and information sharing. A few uh, housekeeping items. Um, there will be a 30 minute uh, question and answer discussion at the end of this session. So uh, please post your questions in the Q&A uh, button on the right side of the attendee hub. Uh, do not use the chat icon for that, that's, uh, that's not being monitored. Uh, all question and answers uh, will be uh, saved as well, by the way. Uh, we have a really exciting lineup of, of speakers today um, for this morning session. Uh, please also be sure to stick around for the closing remarks by John Waller and IBA President John Hechtel. We will start off this session with um, Jasmine Ware. Um, she's currently the polar bear biologist for the government of Nunavut in Iglo Lake in Canada and is presenting work today from her postdoctoral research with the US, US Geological Survey and Washington State University, as well as results from population studies conducted by the, the government of Nunavut. She will also have a second presentation on behalf of Marcus Dyke. Uh, Paul Bear, biologist from the government of Nunavut, who um, unfortunately tragically died in a helicopter crash earlier this year. You probably read the, the news article and the memoriam about that in the International Bear News. Um, so she will do two presentations. Uh, the title of her first presentation is Under the Midnight Sun, Persistence of Circadian Rhythms in Free-Ranging Polar Bears. Jasmine? Thanks, Frank, and thanks everyone for joining. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. Um, this first talk, as Frank said, is a result of my postdoctoral work with WSU and USGS, and it has been published. You can see the link, at the, or the citation at the bottom, but my co-authors are listed here, and really this project came about because essentially a improvement in technology, being able to answer questions. And I think we've seen that in a lot of the presentations so far in this IBA, I've been lucky enough to kind of go at the end and be able to see a lot of you guys' presentations. And it makes me think about not only um, your work and thinking about it, but my work as well, and really how technology has allowed us to really get at some very interesting questions. And this work I think fits in that. So, for a polar bear as an Arctic species that lives in a, in a habitat that we as humans are really limited in, in observing, we really don't know much about what they do when after we put a collar on and they go out on the sea ice or they go out onto land, how they spend their time. And these animals spend 24 hours of the day in light, they'll spend 24 hours in darkness and everything in between. And in a situation like that, the question is, do they have a circadian rhythm? Is it conserved? Is it evolutionarily important to them? And the, our, the research on other Arctic species, it's a little bit mixed. So we really didn't know what, what we were going to find. But we did have a great data set from the USGS and US Fish and Wildlife. And we were able to use eight years of data from 2009 to 2017 that had accelerometer fitted on the GPS collars. So that represented 122 individual females, 39 of those bears wore their collar for more than a year. So we have some long-term data sets for individuals. Um, the accelerometer, it was recording at uh, one Hertz and it would sum that activity up over a minute. And then our, our collars had duty cycles uh, for the activity of 15, 30 minutes, two hours and three hours. So it, it depended. But a pretty, for polar bear, pretty fine scale resolution for us. So we were excited about that. And our 
first question is, are they rhythmic? Do they exhibit uh, behavioral rhythm? Uh, we've been looking and folks look a lot, you know, at movement rates and things like that. But our question was, how do they, do they organize that activity in any sort of uh, rhythmic fashion? And what we found out was by and large, yes, they are rhythmic. This graph shows that the proportion of records. So we bend our records into two week bins. That's because for frequency analysis, periodicity, 10 days is a pretty, pretty good set of time. And we did have some missing observations, of course, this is real data. Um, so this 14 week record allowed us to really get a robust estimate of periodicity during those times. So this is a reflection of all the records. And as you look on the x-axis, you can see through the year that um, the, the rhythmic records were pretty much, or not pretty much, they were more than average, very high percentages. And the darker gray or purple, how it's showing on your screen, were records that were arrhythmic, no rhythmicity detected. And these rhythms could be ultradian, circadian, but there was a rhythm detected uh, for the rhythmic, rhythmic records. And so then we began to ask, well, what could be affecting this? What are some environmental or life history traits that we might be able to tease apart that could be influencing this rhythmicity or lack of? So we looked at habitat, for example, presence or absence of dependent young, the age of those. And, um, and what we looked at is an actogram. And if you're not familiar with these, I know it can seem a bit overwhelming, but they're pretty cool. So I think you're going to love them if you've never seen them. So this is one individual bear. The actogram itself doesn't do any processing, any transforming, nothing with the data. This is her raw data. And all of the black on the graph that you see are um, accelerometer uh, hits and anything that's white is nothing. So it doesn't tell you intensity per se or um, how fast she was moving or anything like that. It's just that she's doing something. And on the x-axis, that is hours of the day. And so it's actually two days plotted, 0, 0,100 to 2,400. And then the next day, 2,400 to 4,800. And that allows us to really visualize patterns as you step back and you look over a long time series, you can see on the y-axis, we're in another temporal scale, May going all the way through the year to March of the next year. Um, the purple or shaded area, again, not sure what's showing up on your computer, that's the nighttime the darkness returning. So May through July, these bears are in 24 hours of, of light, and then they start to slowly, it's not slowly actually, it's quite quickly in terms of, of uh, photo period changes, but they start to experience more darkness. And then by mid-November to mid-January, they're in 24 hours of darkness. So what we see here is, is right off the bat, you can see this bear has organized her activity in late April um, to be mostly coalesced in a nocturnal temporal niche. And then around early May, she quickly switches and becomes more diurnal. And we've seen this kind of temporal niche switching in backcountry grizzly bears, brown bears in Yellowstone National Park. We don't see it, we didn't see it with black bears, interestingly, but records like this, if you go down and you look at September through November, you'll see that her activity changes again. And to me, it's not a great discernible rhythm, if any at all. And then she enters the den and you can see that her activity drops right on off, which is expected. Um, and the, I think this kind of speaks to what um, Anna from the Scandinavian Brown Bear Project was showing us a lot of variability. This is within one record. And I wanted to show you guys what multiple records look like to kind of the take home message that we got was that really these bears are extremely flexible, extremely plastic um, in their activity at least. So the left panel is the panel that was just from the previous slide. And then if we take a look at the second panel to contrast, this is another denning bear. She entered the den, but you can see that around January, uh, mid-January, she exited the den. And you can also notice that her activity from May through July is a little bit different. It's rhythmic, but it looks different than the first panel. The last two panels, those came off of either a 15 or a 30 minute collar. You can see the resolutions a bit uh, better. But again, just to illustrate the, the varied 
activity patterns that we were seeing. The last two pair bears did not den. They had dependent young with them. And that last panel, if you look at her May through July, she's again, she's rhythmic, but she's starting her activity a little later each day and ending it a little later. And it creates this diagonal sweeping um, pattern that you can see. And it's a longer than 24 hour period, essentially. So all of this is to say, we took all of this, looked at those records and biweekly increments, and we asked, is there anything affecting it? And what we found was that in constant 24 hours of light, 90% of our records were actually had a detectable rhythm. But when that shifted to the 24 hour uh, darkness period, only 59% did. For photo period itself, it was a, a small but a direct effect on the period length. So as the amount of hours of daylight increased, period length tended to increase as well. Now, remember that, that first graph with those bars, that little proportion of records that were arrhythmic? Well, what affected that that we found was dinning, probably not surprising. I think it was something like 24% of those records were arrhythmic if a bear was dinning. A habitat as well. So we coded all of those observations using the GPS coordinates that we had as either being on ice, on land, um, or on ice and land. And I, I should say, I forgot to mention that these collared bears uh, were from the southern Beaufort and Chukchi Sea subpopulations, so off the north and west coast of Alaska. So the they do come to land for some of them. And when those bears spent some of their time on ice and in land, on land during that two week record, they were more likely to be arrhythmic. And cliffhanger, as we'll move on to the next one, gotta leave you with some suspense. We also looked at activity peak, we call acrophase. So where is the uh, midpoint of the animal's activity? and what maybe is affecting that. So that's a way to look at kind of how, if things are shifting a bit, things are getting pushed. A lot of people do that with the you know, disturbance work, anthropogenic influences. For us, we found that denning shifted it to a bit later. And if um, the mom, if it was a mom with cubs of the year, she tended to be shifted more nocturnally. And drum roll, feeding, surprise. No one's surprised, of course, feeding. Um, so what we also did was we coded our data to uh, a non-prime feeding period, time period of the year, and then a prime feeding period. And that prime feeding period, as we called it, was when the uh, seals were pupping and the pups were out on the ice and were vulnerable to predation, presumably, and the bears are out hunting at their smorgasbord. So that's that time period from about April to June and really heavy in May and April. And so I just circled this up here because during that time, bears were more likely to be arrhythmic and they also shifted their activities. So their activity peak was at midnight. And remember though, that there's no light cues during this time. So we call it nocturnal, but it isn't nocturnal in the way that we think of in a more temperate uh, latitude. So um, we're not sure why this happened. This is also breeding season, but this was uh, seen across the, the board for, for females with reproductive young as well, who would not be engaging in breeding activities. Presumably uh, females being pursued by males may become arrhythmic and that might have been going on. We just didn't have enough data to really parse that out. So uh, that's it quickly in a nutshell of what we found, which of course I think always leads to more questions, but Fundamentally, uh, free-ranging polar bears in an environment where they are largely undisturbed, kind of living, living their best life, I guess, uh, are, are exhibiting these rhythms. And there's a ton of intra-individual variability and inter-individual variability. I mean, the take-home for me was everything's different. So, and with that, I'd like to acknowledge all the supporters and some folks that really did a lot of um, data work with me. And then of course, all of these capture crews and management staff that have, have curated this data for decades, um, as well as all of the supporters and funders. So um, with that, I think Frank, I'm going on to the second one. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Okay. All right. 
All right, you're not done with me yet. I'm still here. So this is my second talk. And as um, Frank so uh, kindly mentioned, this was supposed to be done a uh, talk by Marcus uh, Dick. This is work that he, the data he collected with, for the government of Nunavut on a couple of population studies um, presenting on his behalf. And I really appreciate the organizers allowing me to do that. I am pretty certain he would, he would want this out there. He was very excited. We were very excited to come to Kalispell. Um, and so uh, anyways, this is kind of uh, the interesting results that came out of a, a, the most, some of the most recent population assessments out of, of, out of Nunavut. And it deals with polar bear body condition, which we have been hearing a bit about. Again, I have that uh, advantage of hearing other people's talks. So it's pretty cool. And the two populations that uh, that Marcus was, was assessing the Gulf of Boothia and McClintock channel subpopulations. And these two subpopulations are neighbors. They such as Western Hudson Bay, Baffin Bay, Davis Strait, um, these two subpopulations there in the central Arctic often were, I had, I hope you guys can hear me. My internet connection says it's unstable. So Frank, just holler if I freeze. Uh, what we were looking at or what was typically seen would be this kind of uh, very thick multi-year ice. And that was persisting according to the literature kind of up until the early 2000s. And then from about the mid 2000s onward, it's really drastically changed. And that's been also supported. Uh, Marcus and I were in the communities last fall in Johaven, Tlojok and the hunters were saying the ice is very, very different. The elders have no advice because they've never seen it like that. So uh, shipping is increasing and all of these ice changes, uh, Marcus and I were thinking is really maybe what is behind as a proxy to some of the underlying ecosystem habitat changes, productivity changes on the results that, that we found in terms of uh, body condition. So when we uh, talk about body condition in this case, this would be a typical view of what the observer was doing when they classified body condition for this study. So uh, these two areas were done, were covered in between 2014 and 2017 in a capture mark recapture using uh, DNA biopsy. And this was contrasted with the previous study in these two subpopulation areas, which was done in 1998 to 2000. During the 98 to 2000 study, the bears were immobilized and physically handled and their body condition was done through physical handling. Now, there've been a few of these subpopulation assessments where we've had physical handling versus um, biopsy body condition aerial, aerial uh, uh, classification. And we think that the method is, is not a huge source of bias because depending on the population, there have been results that find that body condition has improved over time, decreased over time. So we have both uh, in to kind of, it's a nice control, if you will. So the body condition scoring is the standard scale, one to five, skinny to obese. And then we further kind of categorize those as poor, average, and good. And I've indicated what the, the actual raw scores would be for those categories. And to give you an idea of, of where uh, Marcus flew, this is McClintock Channel on the left and Gulf of Boothia on the right, uh, just as they are in, in real life. And these are his tracks all three years for McClintock and then a representative one year for Gulf of Boothia. So the, the subpopulation areas were covered completely with the exception of a few areas where local representatives and hunters, local knowledge indicated it wasn't worth the effort. There weren't any bears there. And when we look at the raw body condition scores, and I feel bad, everyone has such beautiful graphs. <laughs> you guys get a table. <laughs> but if I just draw your eye to the bottom row, this is kind of the, the important part. In the left three columns, we have the 98 to 2000 results and the proportions are in the parentheticals. And then if you look over to the right, we have the 2014 to 2017 
uh, raw numbers and the percentages. And that bottom left corner in that 98 to 2000 study, it's a fair proportion of bears being classified in four conditions, so a one or a two. And you contrast that with the 2014 to 2017, and you can see a, a shift. These, the classifications went more to average and to good. And when we um, think about that, just like with the circadian stuff, what is affecting? What is driving this? So we wanted to do an analysis that would be comparable to what has been done elsewhere. Uh, again, I think it was um, Anna with the Scandinavian Brown Bear Project. She got a question like, how do we take this information? And it's been a theme. How do we take the information from our studies and allow it or think carefully on how it could be applied or useful across the board. And that was something we tried to do here. While we can't combine the data from the subpopulations, we can maybe analyze it in a similar way that allows us to make uh, comparisons. So Baffin Bay and Kane Basin were, were recently completed and we modeled our analysis after that. So we included reproductive class, age class. Um, we did an ice metric, which in this case, for these two subpopulations, because they don't become strictly ice free, this ice metric was the duration of days that the ice was below the average of the midpoint between maximum ice and the minimum, which again, isn't 0% ice concentration in these two areas. Although in most recent years, it's been getting very, very close. So we'll probably be getting there soon. And then we included the day of the year the bear was sampled. This was done in the springtime on the sea ice. And uh, this was during the prime feeding period, if we'll call it that, seals were pupping. And we predicted that the later in the year, so further out from April and like June, the bears would be in better body condition because they had more time presumably to forage and, and access those food resources. So no surprise, this graph is just simply a representation of the table showing that the probability of a bear being classified in poor condition was much greater in that 98 to 2000 study, while in the, the, the later study, 14 to 17, they were much more likely to be um, classified in good condition. We also did find an effect of when the bear was sampled. So the it's again, the pr probability of a bear being classified in one of these body conditions. The top line is average. As you saw, a lot of our bears were in average condition and that increased over time. And the probability of being in poor condition decreased over time. Now, the question that remains with all of this is as this habitat goes from this sort of look and moves into uh, more of the dynamic, annual ice, thinner ice, at this time, it appears that this is a benefit because uh, anecdotally, observationally, Marcus said there were tons of seals, uh, hunters say there's tons of seals, and Karen Rhodes' talk in the Chuck GC, I thought, really applied to this as well. We didn't directly, we don't have any data on seal body condition, but it is perhaps that the seals are also doing better in this habitat, and also the, the bears, as we know, from previous research, ice can get really, really low in concentration and they'll still be out there and hunting. And so this environment is quite good, if you ask me, for, uh, for a bear, because as we move from this multi-year thick rubble ice and we get into this more dynamic ice, presumably the productivity is going up, seals are going up and bears are out there uh, taking advantage of it, that. Now, the question is, uh, how long is this going to continue? And I think we have some clues from uh, previous, or not previous, but ongoing or other subpopulations where um, seasonal, seasonal ice, per, uh, they're in a seasonal ice environment. Whew, talking this morning. So places like Western Hudson Bay, Southern Hudson Bay, Baffin Bay, I think we're getting clues as to what's potentially in store for this particular, these two subpopulations. Um, the other thing to note is that these two subpopulations are, as Karen Road is mentioning, they're, they're over shallow waters. So they're not like the Southern Beaufort over deep, deep waters. So I think as long as some ice is there, it still has the potential to be good habitat as 
the Chukchi Sea. I'd like to acknowledge all of the um, funders and the local assistants, field assistants, everyone that made this happen. And of course, um, we always, you know, this couldn't be possible without Marcus. And I have to personally thank him. A great mentor. Wish I could have learned more. It um, been a big, big loss for us. And so I really appreciate everyone's interest and the opportunity to share this with you. So thank you. Thank you, Jasmine, for these fascinating studies. Wonderful work. We'll move on to our next speaker. And that is Amy Talion. She is a postdoctoral researcher at the Norwegian Institute for Nature Research, or NINA. She received her PhD from uh, Utah State University in 2017, for which she studied part of the prey interactions in Yellowstone National Park. The work she is reporting on today is an outgrowth of those studies, and the title of her presentation is St. Patrick Predators, the Effect of Brown Bears on Wolf Hunting Behavior. Amy? Thanks, Frank. Okay, I assume that everybody can see that all right. Um, yeah, so today I'm gonna to talk about uh, bears and wolves and the nature of competition between the two. And I'd first like to thank uh, all the people <laughs> listed here on this slide and institutions that helped guide and support this research. Um, I really couldn't have done it without you all. And this research is gonna be published in ecological monographs, hopefully sometime by next week. Um, yeah, and I really couldn't have done this a massive project without their help. So as you know, by and large, um, wolves share the majority of their range with brown bears. Uh, wolves and brown bears are two, really two of the most heavily studied large carnivores on the planet. Um, but historically, the majority of the research has generally focused on either wolves or bears, kind of independently of one another. And this leaves a bit of a missing link in the understanding of this kind of classic trophic chain. So we still know relatively little about how these two species affect each other. And what I'm going to discuss here today is research uh, coming out of Yellowstone National Park and the Scandinavian Peninsula in Norway and Sweden. Now, in Scandinavia, uh, wolves persist in the central part of the peninsula in areas that have bear populations further north and areas that don't have bear populations further south. So the brown shading here represents brown bear range uh, and the small black circles are an example of wolf territories throughout the peninsula um, from about 2008, I think. And for the most part, Scandinavia is a moose dominated system, uh, meaning wolves primarily prey on moose throughout the year and bears also hunt newborn moose calves during the birthing period. Now in Yellowstone, uh, wolves and bears are sympatric throughout the entire park. Uh, Yellowstone is more of an elk dominated system, uh, meaning elk are the main ungulate prey for both wolves and bears. Uh, although there are many other prey species uh, for them to choose from that wolves do hunt and scavenge on in Yellowstone. Um, bears in Yellowstone also hunt newborn calves, of course, uh, and similar to Scandinavia, they kind of rarely prey on adult ungulates, although that can happen as I'm sure you've seen in, in videos. Now, wolves and bears are both apex meat eaters. They're competitors and they compete in a few different ways. So I'm gonna walk you through this a little bit. Uh, first, they compete directly for access to ungulate carcasses, uh, whether those carcasses are wolf killed or otherwise. And this is called, of course, interference competition. So interference competition often includes direct interactions between individuals that, resort, that result in resource exclusion for the subordinate competitor. A direct interactions occur most often near carcasses where bears and wolves participate in a, in a tug of war for dominance. 
And although the outcomes are usually not defined by a true winner or a true loser, meaning both species are usually able to gain access to the resource at some point, bears typically dominate and are generally able to steal carcasses from wolves. Now, bears and wolves also compete indirectly, uh, meaning they compete over finite food resources, such as newborn ungulates. This is also called exploitation competition. Uh, in the context of predation, exploitation competition occurs when the presence of one predator diminishes the supply of a shared prey resource in the landscape, like newborn calves, functionally leaving less food available to the competing predator. So these are the types of competition we expect to see between wolves and brown bears in, in ungulate driven systems like Yellowstone and Scandinavia. And we were interested to see how this competition might manifest. Um, in a previous study, this research group uh, that we actually presented at the IBA conference in Anchorage, um, we showed that the presence of brown bears actually decreased wolf kill rates. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into the details here, but essentially we found that in both Scandinavia and Yellowstone, bear presence, whether that was in a wolf territory or at a wolf kill site, was, was correlated with extended kill intervals and decreased kill rates. And this result was really contrary to that traditional expectation that wolves kill more often where they coexist with brown bears, uh, which is what many of us had previously assumed. So we were really curious to dig further into this and explore why this might be going on. Uh, behaviorally speaking, a kill interval, um, or the time between kills, in its simplest form, is the sum of time a predator spends handling or eating the first prey and searching for and killing the second. So if either one of these components kind of independently increases or decreases, so too does kill interval. I'll quickly explain the hypotheses we came up with for why bears decreased wolf kill rate and how we kind of decided to test this and explore this in these systems. Um, in other words, how we explored what type of competition was going on behind the scenes that resulted in these decreased kill rates. Now, if bears are interfering with wolves and causing them to spend more time at a carcass, then we might expect that the handling time of wolves would increase in the presence of bears, while their search time would remain the same, as you can kind of see on this graph. However, if bears were depleting the amount of shared available prey in a landscape through exploitation competition, uh, then we might expect the opposite pattern, right? So increased search times in the presence of bears and constant handling times. And then of course, if both of these mechanisms were occurring, we would expect to see changes to both handling and search time when bears were present. We examined this in Scandinavia and Yellowstone uh, by GPS collaring wolves and conducting predation studies to find their kill sites and then basically following them around, using that data to see whether the time they spent near their kill sites or handling time changed when bears were present, and then also whether bear presence affected wolf search time. We looked at this in two seasons, uh, spring and summer in Scandinavia, and then summer in Yellowstone, uh, when the potential for competition kind of differed. Uh, during spring in Scandinavia, wolves mostly prey on the previous year's moose calves, uh, targeting a few adults here and there. Bears in Scandinavia rarely prey on adult moose, but do regularly use wolf kills during this time period. And we found that during spring, wolf handling time was generally greater in areas where they coexisted with bears compared to areas where they were allopatric. So here we're showing uh, wolf handling time throughout the spring in areas where they're sympatric with brown bears in brown and areas where they're allopatric in gray. Now, during the same time period, search time was functionally the same between the two areas. So this really suggests that interference competition uh, was likely the main type of competition occurring between wolves and bears in this system during spring. Now it's difficult to know the exact mechanism driving this, um, but what we think is happening is that wolves will move off if and when bears visit a kill, and then come back later to see if the bear has moved on, or they move away more often to functionally mitigate interactions with bears. And indeed, we, we, we see that, or at least we see a hint of it. Uh, this graph shows the number of independent visits wolves made to carcasses 
And you can see it's greater in sympatric areas. So wolves move back and forth between their kills more often, where they're sympatric with bears, which in turn increases handling time. Now, during summer in Scandinavia, wolves turn to neonate calves. Uh, and indeed, in this system in Scandinavia, almost 90% of their kills are newborn calves during this time period. Um, the bears are also preying heavily on newborn calves then too, which means there's greater potential for exploitation competition during summer because they share a prey resource. And indeed, that's, that's pretty much what we found. Um, these graphs are similar to the ones I just showed you, but now for summer. And we really found no difference in prey handling time between the areas with and without bears during summer. But we do see a difference in search time. Uh, search time during summer decreases in areas where wolves are allopatric in gray, uh, shown in gray here, possibly because more and more neonates become available on the landscape as the birthing period progresses. Um, however, search time stays steady or even slightly increases through the season in areas where wolves coexist with bears, shown in brown. So exploitation competition was likely the main type of competition occurring during summer in Scandinavia. Um, and these patterns I should note uh, were found after controlling for other important factors that might affect this relationship. So things like the size of the prey, moose density in the area, wolf nutritional status, and so on. I'm just kind of skipping over some of the methods so I can show you some of the results. Now in Yellowstone, we have a somewhat more complicated system. Uh, during summer, both bears and wolves prey on newborn elk, but wolf predation is more even in summer than it is in Scandinavia. Uh, wolves in Yellowstone are also targeting adult or yearling elk, as well as a variety of other prey species. And in Yellowstone, bears fully coexist with wolves throughout the park. That means that we had to look at how bear presence at kill sites rather than bear presence in a wolf territory affected wolf handling time. And we see a somewhat similar pattern as we did in Scandinavia. Um, this graph is a bit messy, but what we ultimately found was that in Yellowstone, handling time increased with bear presence at smaller prey, but decreased with bear presence at larger prey. And as always hap uh, manages to happen in ecology, our findings were somewhat counterintuitive, but we think we might have an idea about why this is happening in this system. So with smaller prey, it might be more worthwhile to stay and vie for dominance. There's a shorter amount of time the kill is active, and that means fewer bears may have a chance to find it as well. But with larger kills, like bison, uh, the carcass is on the ground and active for a much longer time period. That makes it more likely that bears will find it and come to feed. So there could be a competitive tipping point after which it's no longer advantageous for wolves to defend or try and gain access to their kill. And there was some evidence for this, so wolves returned to larger carcasses less often when bear sign was detected. So we did find evidence for interference competition during summer in Yellowstone, but what about exploitation competition? Um, well, there's really no biological reason to expect that bear presence at a kill site would affect subsequent wolf search time. Um, but, you know, we do think that exploitation competition is likely occurring during the season in Yellowstone also. Um, in the park, bears, both black and grizzly, kill a lot of neonate calves early on in the summer, which likely leaves fewer calves for wolves uh, to access during the rest of the summer and, and throughout the rest of the year as well. So the bottom line is that these, uh, that these two species do affect each other. Our research clearly demonstrates that wolves provide subsidies to bears, uh, likely in most places where they coexist. But the ultimate effect of wolves on individual bear fitness and bear population dynamics still kind of remains unknown. And so wolves facilitate bears. Uh, could facilitation work the other way? Well, there's really little evidence to suggest that, at least in Scandinavia and Yellowstone and systems that are primarily ungulate driven. Uh, here and in most systems, bears primarily kill ungulate neonates. Um, these are small prey packages that are consumed quickly with little food left over for, for scavenging really. So what we likely see is kleptoparasitism or uh, functionally parasitism by theft. 
And indeed, our findings suggest that wolves don't hunt more often to compensate for the loss of food to brown bears. So this implies that bears might negatively affect the foraging ability of wolves, meaning wolf populations that are sympatric with brown bears could suffer fitness consequences, although that is also something that remains to be determined. However, the nature of competition between wolves and bears is, is system and context dependent. As you know, um, there's always a caveat, right? Uh, so for example, in systems where bears more commonly kill adult ungulates, we might see more facilitation. Um, so in Alaska, bears prey on adult and subadult musk ox, and wolves have been observed scavenging on these kills. And also differences in prey guild composition could lead to a reversal of these kind of typical competitive roles. Um, in coastal systems in Alaska, where ungulate abundance is low, bears can provide the subsidies and wolves can be par kleptoparasitic, uh, meaning wolves can steal salmon from bears. So the potential for this kind of reverse facilitation really likely depends on the system, um, whether bears prey on larger animals or whether they bring um, any food to the table, so to say. So although they're, uh, they're both still sympatric throughout much of their range today, of course, both species have undergone range contractions, uh, leaving wolf and bear populations that persist really independently of one another. And it's possible that allopatry or persisting alone may result in a competitive release for wolves. Um, and for bears, allopatry could result in a decrease in, of course, temporally stable high protein food sources. Uh, and in combination, uh, it, that could result in generally altered predator prey dynamics and altered strength of top down forcing within those ecosystems. With that, I once again want to thank um, all the funders and all of the partners in this project and uh, move on to the next presenter. Thanks, Amy, for that excellent presentation. It really shows the, the value of looking at multi-species systems across multiple ecosystems and big collaborative effort. That's wonderful. Thanks. Um, we will actually have a, a coffee break here. So we'll have um, about 30 minutes for a coffee break and then continue with uh, two more presentations in this session before we uh, reach the, the closing remarks. Well, hello, we will continue this session on bear ecology and behavior. And I'm uh, pleased to introduce our next speaker, Jenny Hansen. Uh, she is a PhD research fellow in behavioral and landscape ecology at the University of Southeastern Norway. And she will uh, continue on a uh, with work on a brown bear study. Her presentation title is, does the social environment influence settlement decisions in female brown bears? Okay, I hope everyone can see my presentation. Uh, thanks for the introduction and greetings to the bear community from Norway. I'm excited today to share part of my PhD research um, regarding the influence of the social environment on female brown bear settlement. I'd first like to take this opportunity to acknowledge my co-authors on this study, Anna Hartel, Shane Frank, Jona Schinberg and Andrea Sedrosser. And this research is part of the Scandinavian Brown Bear Project, as well as Bear Connect. But before we can address the question on this title slide, I first need to ask and answer a couple of other questions so you can understand why I'm asking this question in the first place. So the first question is, why study female settlement at all? It's sort of a general consensus that in brown bears, males are the dispersing sex and females are largely philpatric, preferring to settle in or overlapping their natal home ranges. This should be the end of the story, but it's more complicated. Research on our study population in Sweden has shown a marked difference in female settlement patterns than in other populations. So for example, those in North America. And importantly, we see that upwards of 40% of females in this population disperse, and some of those as far as 80 to 90 kilometers away from their natal home range. 
And because we see such a difference in the proportion of females that are dispersing, as well as the long distances they sometimes disperse, we're interested in going a little bit beyond distance and seeing what other mechanisms might be responsible for these patterns. So this leads to the next question. Are brown bears socially aware? And you might be thinking, well, brown bears are a solitary species. What does sociality have to do with it? And I would answer that multiple studies that have now been coming out on the Scandinavian population have indicated that female bears do appear to be aware of the social environment around them. And starting around 2005, we started to see evidence of female bears responding to social organization of the other females on the landscape. And work by Stein and others has suggested that dispersing females may encounter barriers known as social fences in which more aggressive or dominant females may inhibit settlement into an area. And subsequent work in the population has also shown other social phenomena, such as female reproductive suppression and delayed primaparity. More recently, Frank et al. has shown that following the removal of a female on the landscape through regulated hunting, the neighboring females will begin to take over her previous home range in the two years following her death. And this is suggestive of a social awareness um, of other females on the landscape. Now being aware of the social environment could be valuable for females in order to improve their opportunities for settling an independent home range and beginning breeding. And the social resistance hypothesis suggests that individuals on the landscape can either facilitate or hinder settling individuals based on the social structure and organization. So that brings us back to the original question. Does the social environment influence female settlement decisions? We propose that it does. And we hypothesize that females may gain their awareness of the social environment in the time period where they're traveling with their mother in that period of maternal care. And so we use a resource selection function approach at the second order to investigate this question. And I'll now describe that procedure in detail. So because the second order of selection occurs at the level of the home range, we first needed to estimate the home ranges of the females in the study area. And from that, we identified 56 focal females that had available VHF and GPS data where we could estimate their natal range and settlement home range. Uh, the natal range was measured in the year prior to family breakup. And the settlement home range was estimated two years following family breakup prior to primaparity. We also estimated the home ranges of all of the other females on the landscape, which we called non-focal females. And their data was between the years 1998 to 2018, and that corresponded to 1,259 barriers. All home ranges were the 95% kernel density estimate, and for each of these, we calculated a home range centroid. And for the focal females, we measured the distance between their natal range centroid and their settlement home range centroid in order to generate a dispersal kernel for the population. So the next step was to extract variables that were representative of the social environment. We extracted these by overlaying the natal and settlement home ranges of our focal females over those of all of the other females on the landscape in their respective years. So we first identified all of the females that overlap the natal range. From this, we took the total number of overlapping females as natal density. And we also designated all of the females overlapping the natal range as known females. Then we took all of the females settlement ranges and overlapped those with the other females. And we derived four social variables. The first was maternal overlap. So whether or not a female was overlapping her mother's home range. The second was a relatedness ratio. So how many related females are overlapping divided by the number of total overlapping females. The third was familiarity index. And this was looking at the number of familiar females. And these were the ones that were designated known, the ones that were overlapping the natal range and divided by the total number of overlapping females. 
And lastly, we calculated a density difference, which was the difference between the number of overlapping females in the settlement home range and those of the natal range. And importantly, a focal female's mother was not included in either relatedness ratio or familiarity index because she's already represented in the mother overlap variable. I'll now describe the procedure that we use for the resource selection function. So we took the previously calculated dispersal kernel to determine the availability space for sampling, and that corresponded to 25 kilometers from the natal range. And for each used settlement home range, we randomly selected five available settlement home ranges that were weighted on probability. And we created used and available home ranges as buffered centroids. And these were buffered by 10 and a half kilometers, which was based on a sensitivity analysis that we had generated using all of the sizes of home, home ranges of females in the study area. So then we extracted all of the social variables that were described on the previous slide for all the used and the available settlement home ranges. We then fit a binomial generalized linear mix model that contained the four social variables as predictors and two random effects, model, random effects uh, variables, one which contained the ID of the focal individual and one which contained the ID of the mother as some of the individuals shared a mother. We also looked at all of the interactions among the social predictors, but we did not find any significant predict or significant interactions. So the model we retained is the one shown here. So what did we find? Well, first we found that maternal overlap had the largest effect in our model. That was followed by the familiarity index and density difference. We did not find an effect with relatedness ratio. Shown another way, we can look at the probability of a female selecting a settlement home range based on these social variables. So for example, we see that females show a selection preference for a settlement home range that overlaps their mother. We also see that similarly with selecting for a settlement home range that has a higher number of familiar females. When it comes to density, we see that females have shown selection for settlement home ranges that have a higher density than those of their natal range. But surprisingly, we didn't find any sort of relationship with females when it comes to selecting for areas where they can overlap related females. So what does this mean? Well, our biggest takeaway is that it does appear that the social environment is influencing female settlement in this population. But given that previous studies have found that social organization is reflecting kinship and that kin recognition has been suggested, we were surprised to learn that females don't show any preference for overlapping with kin. They do, however, prefer areas with familiar females. So our study cast doubt on kin recognition in this population. Familiar females may or may not be kin, but they more likely represent social tolerance on the landscape. And so they may facilitate females who are going out and settling their home ranges after a family breakup. The most tolerant female on the landscape is undoubtedly the female's mother. And this has been shown in the results of our study. We were also surprised to find that females settle in areas with higher density because this was the complete opposite that from our expectations. And it may be that females in higher density areas are reflecting the availability of resources such as food or denning locations. And it may be that females are reluctant to go out into areas that have low or no conspecific presence. This has important implications for demographics and for management because if females continue to just settle and disperse into these high density core areas, and they instead don't go out into the lower density periphery, then the population expansion into adjacent suitable habitat may not occur. And critically, because this population is subjected to annual hunting, being socially aware of your neighbors may be important for these females for survival and reproduction in an ever-changing social landscape. Importantly, our study is just a first step in looking into social dynamics of female brown bears. So more research is needed to understand the mechanisms with which these females are gaining this awareness. 
We believe the most likely mechanism is through scent com communication that they get from shared rub trees in their overlapping home ranges. And more and more research is coming out that is suggesting the importance of rub trees and rub objects in scent communication in brown bears. There's also the potential that these females are coming into re regular direct contact with each other in their overlapping home ranges. So that's, that would be interesting to look at. Another area that would be worthy to explore is to determine whether females who are settling in areas that overlap their mother or overlap a higher number of familiar females are gaining some sort of fitness benefit from that, either in terms of higher survival or greater reproduction, um, and compare that with females that are settling in more socially marginal areas. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the IBA for allowing me to present my research in this live session, and thank you all for your attention. I look forward to answering any questions that you may have during the Q&A. And if you'd like to contact me, um, feel free to reach out on either email or you can find me on Twitter if you'd like to get more on the specifics regarding the study. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny, for this excellent presentation. It's amazing how much more we're learning about the, the social lives of, of bears. And this is an excellent example uh, yeah, of, of that. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is uh, John Beckman. He has studied American black bears in the Great Basin Desert of Nevada in the United States and other areas of North America for the last 25 years. Um, his talk is about recolonizing carnivores. Is cougar predation behaviorally mediated by bears? Now, John is uh, currently in a location where his uh, internet connection is a little sketchy. He will join us for the Q&A. Uh, so, so please post your questions, but we will play a pre-recorded presentation for him. And Kate Smith will cue that up. Thank you. Before I get started today, I want to acknowledge my co-authors. Uh, first, uh, Kristen Ingebretson, uh, Carl Lackey, Allison Andreessen, Pat Jackson, and Julie Young. All of the data that I'll present and talk about today, uh, we just recently published this year in a uh, issue of Ecology and Evolution in a paper led by uh, Kristen. As we all know, uh, intra-guild predator interactions can have important uh, impacts and consequences for ecosystem dynamics. And these can be things like interference competition, kleptoparasitism, where a dominant uh, predator may be uh, scavenging um, the kill sites of subordinate uh, carnivores, but also things like intra-guild predation. And all these may alter kill rates or cause prey switching. Uh, when we look at American black bears in the Great Basin Desert of the uh, state of Nevada in the Western United States, one of the things that uh, we've seen when you look at this map here on the right is that the single hatching is the historical distribution of uh, black bears in the Great Basin. And we published this in a paper in 2013 in the Journal of Wildlife Management. Um, because of uh, habitat alterations um, and deforestation, but also removal of bears through direct conflicts with people, uh, both black bears and brown bears or grizzlies were extirpated by the early 1900s. However, as the habitats slowly started to recover from the 1940s through the 1980s, we started to see uh, natural population recovery of black bears into the western uh, parts of the Great Basin. That's shown here on the map in the double hatching inside the red circle, which is our steady area. Uh, we also uh, helped uh, this uh, natural recolonization uh, through conservation and management actions of bears in the system. Um, and so we started to see and continue to see range expansion of bears back into the system. Uh, we documented this in a long-term uh, research study that uh, Carl Lackey and myself began in the mid-1990s. To date, we've captured and marked over a thousand bears, many of these with GPS collars. Um, in the most recent population estimate that we've published, we've done more recent estimates, but the most recent published one in 2014 for the Western Nevada steady area, that region in the double hatching, we estimated that we have about 450 uh, black bears in this area. 
At the same time as bears were extirpated, we saw habitat changes that led to an increase in mule deer into the system, which was followed by uh, cougars, uh, puma can color uh, into this region um, where they historically were not at very high levels at all. And so in the 80 year absence of bears, uh, cougars became the apex predator in the system. Um, and Allison Andreessen, uh, working with myself and Kelly Stewart and Carl Lackey and others, um, have been uh, studying cougar uh, populations in this region since 2008. <clears throat> and so because of these two long-term studies on bears and cougars, we've had the opportunity to evaluate competitive interactions of these two species. <clears throat> so the objectives of our study were, were twofold. One, we wanted to determine the prey composition and feeding bout duration of cougars across multiple sites in the Great Basin of Western Nevada and assess if increasing bear densities over time throughout the region uh, impacts prey composition, duration of feeding uh, bouts by cougars and kill rates of cougars. <clears throat> this is just our study uh, site again in Western Nevada and uh, the Great Basin in the Western part of the US. Uh, we had uh, several uh, study sites uh, with bears in them, including the Carson Range, which is the Sierra Nevada study site, uh, but also Great Basin Ranges such as the Pine Nut Range and the Sweetwater Range. And we also had three sites with no bears at the beginning and are starting to have a few more bears over time, uh, the Virginia Range, the Virginia Mountains, and the Peterson or Dogskin Range. And over time, all of these mountain ranges that are in the Great Basin, so all the steady areas other than the Carson Range, have seen an increase in bears over time. To collect data, uh, we placed GPS collars on 31 cougars. Um, and 50 plus uh, GPS collared American black bears. Uh, we collected a kill uh, data uh, for cougars during the bear active season, which we defined as 1st of March through 31st of October uh, for the eight year period from 2009 to 2017. And we investigated kill sites by cougars and determined a prey species composition. We used an algorithm that was published by Knopf et al. in 2009, and we defined a kill site by a cougar as any place that had at least two GPS locations with 200, within 200 meters, including at least one location obtained overnight. And we investigated over 1,000 uh, kill sites with 884 uh, of those having confirmed uh, prey items at the location. For our analysis of feeding bout duration, we classified a prey into five weight class categories, which you can see down here in the lower left of the screen, uh, anywhere from uh, prey items that were greater than 90 kilograms, which we considered extra large. These were things like yearling or subadult and adult feral horses, uh, down to extra small kill items, uh, which prey items which were less than seven kilograms and included things like birds, lagomorphs, rodents, um, et cetera. We then calculated feeding bout duration, uh, recorded evidence of things like bear scavenging, uh, the local bear density, deer density, feral horse density, big horn sheep density, and other factors, and plugged these into linear uh, mixed effects models. We included mixed effects models uh, because we wanted to account for individual variation uh, of individual cougars, and so we included a, a factor of individual cougar ID. Now, similar studies focus on feeding rates of cougars have calculated biomass of prey killed per day in a set monitoring period or a kill rate using interkill intervals. Uh, but due to the data uh, and the nature of our data, uh, where we were concerned about potential lag times between when the kill site was uh, made and when we investigated it, we chose to model the number of nights spent feeding at a kill or scavenging site as the feeding bout duration. Uh, this metric of handling time at a prey item is directly linked to energetic return to the cougar, but it's also robust to any time lags in data collection by field crews. We then employed these linear fixed effects models in program R. Our response variable for feeding bout duration was the log of nights spent on a prey item. Again, we included cougar ID as a random intercept to control for individual cougar variation. We used 10 potential covariates in our models. Uh, things like a binary covariate for local bear occupancy, a bear, binary covariate for bear visitation, but we also included things like the presence of any age-dependent kitten, uh, the presence of kittens greater than three months of age because we know that kittens can have an impact on cougar uh, feeding bout duration, and then we had data and collected uh, information, including them on models on things like prey weight class, cougar sex, local bear density, local deer density, and days between kill uh, and investigation, 
which I will report here that in none of our models was the lag time between kill site and investigation. It was never significant in any of our models. Um, and then we developed a set of 44 um, a priori models that we tested. Uh, we then also looked at prey composition to examine the effects of bear recolonization on cougar prey composition in the Great Basin. We used the same uh, data set as kill sites, but instead of classifying the prey items based on their approximate live weight, we separate the identified prey species into three taxonomic groups, uh, mule deer, feral horses, and other, uh, which included things like domestic uh, livestock, bighorn sheep, and non-ungulate prey. Uh, because of the differences in large prey availability between the Sierra and Nevada site, where we really only had mule deer as a large uh, prey item, and the Great Basin, where we also had feral horses and uh, bighorn sheep, we also divided the prey composition data set into the two regions, and we fit the two regional data sets with the same 25 models. We also want to determine the direction of prey switching that may occur when alternative large prey is available. And so we modeled the proportion of horses in cougar diet for the Great Basin data set only um, since there are no feral horses in the Sierra Nevada. Again, uh, we used uh, program R to do our analysis. Uh, we also used the beta distribution um, in package uh, GLMM TMB in program R, and we chose a beta distribution because our response variable, uh, the proportion of deer and cougar diet was bound between zero and one. Uh, we included covariates for presence again of kittens um, of any age or the presence of kittens greater than three months, uh, cougar sex, local bear density, local deer density, and again, days between kill uh, and investigation and a binary covariate for local bear occupancy. Uh, this slide's uh, pretty busy, but I just want to make a couple points. These are the top uh, mixed models uh, for in A here. It's for feeding bout duration, um, the number of nights spent on a prey item. B, it's uh, deer and uh, the diet composition of cougars across all sites. C is deer and diet composition just this year in Nevada. The models for D are for deer and diet composition in the Great Basin, and for E is the proportion of horses. Uh, I just want to point out that in almost all of our top rank models, uh, two factors were consistently important, that being bear density and then uh, individual cougar ID, so that individual uh, variation. Uh, when we look at the number of nights spent feeding across all uh, prey item sizes uh, here in the A, uh, panel A, you can see across bear densities, as bear density went up, the number of nights spent feeding on a, an item uh, went down. Uh, when we look at the impact of kittens in B for cougar feeding, not surprisingly has been shown in other studies uh, with the presence of kittens, the number of nights uh, spent feeding by uh, female cougars uh, declined over time. When we look at the proportion of deer in cougar diet, um, Females are in the lighter color, uh, males or cougars are in the dark color. Over time, we've seen the proportion of deer in the cougar diets across the entire study site uh, go down. When we separate out Sierra Nevada uh, areas in the left and Great Basin in the right over time and across uh, uh, different bear densities and across year, we see that the proportion of deer and cougar diets is declining for both males and female cougars. Um, and at the same time, the proportion of feral horses in the Great Basin um, in uh, cougar diets is increasing over time uh, with also an increase in bear density. So in summary, we see that prey size is the most important factor uh, determining uh, feeding bout duration across sites and years, but bear density and bear scavenging also significantly influences uh, cougar feeding bout duration and prey composition. The most important variables driving cougar feeding uh, bout duration uh, during the time of year when bears are also active include the size of the current prey item, uh, prey density, and kitten presence. And an increase in the local bear density is associated with shorter cougar feeding uh, durations on each uh, food item. Now, in our study, we weren't able to disentangle the, and differentiate between scavenging by bears and true kleptoparasitism, where they were uh, uh, actively uh, kicking uh, cougars off kill sites. And that's something we would recommend that we tease apart uh, in future studies. Uh, cougars in areas with higher bear density spent fewer nights feeding on a given prey item, which may require them to hunt again more quickly to fulfill their energetic needs. Um, and the proportion of mule deer and Cougar diets across all study areas declined over time, 
um, was lower for male cougars and increased with the presence of deep dependent kittens and also increased with higher bear densities. In sites with feral horses, which is a novel, large and uh, non-native prey item, cougar composition of feral horses also increased over time. And our results suggest that higher bear densities uh, may reduce cougar feeding bout durations and influence the prey selection uh, trade-off for cougars when alternative but more dangerous large prey is available. Uh, with that, I wanna thank our uh, funding uh, sources, the Nevada Department of Wildlife, uh, Pittman-Robertson Act's um, money, uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society and Utah State University. I also want to acknowledge uh, help with field data collection uh, with uh, by Cassie Hughes, Renee Seidler, Ayla Anderson, Heather uh, Reich, and I'll thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks, John, for that excellent presentation. Another great example of a, a multi-species system, long-term studies, and the value of long-term data in really uh, addressing some, some key ecological questions. With that, we uh, ask all the presenters to, to start their videos, and um, we will start the Q&A. We've got a lot of really good questions already. Um, keep posting them. And we'll start off with the um, first one being for, for Jasmine. And this is from, from Mike Madel. Did you or Marcus find any correlation with polar bears that were more rhythmic to be in better condition? Or was body condition more se a seasonal issue of variation on prey abundance as sea ice environments changed? Thanks, Frank. And thanks, Mike, for the great question a lot packed in there. So. First off, for the body condition results from McClintock and Gulf of Boothia, those bears in, in neither study, 98 or 2000, or 2014 to 2017, were the bears wearing collars. So we don't have any idea about their activity at all. Uh, for the bears that we do have rhythmicity data on, that, those were in the Chukchi and Southern Beaufort Sea. And um, quite frankly, the, the data, we, we don't know what their body condition was. Uh, and as you saw from those actograms, they would switch between nocturnal, diurnal, become arrhythmic. These bears exhibited kind of every activity pattern you can think of all within a year. Some were more strict than others. It was, it really was quite variable. One of the things I think would be interesting that we're kind of getting to, this data didn't allow it, uh, is that some of the talks we've heard this these couple of weeks are how uh, specific behaviors are being extracted from the high resolution accelerometer work. And I think once we have that piece, then we may be able to piece a little bit more together of what these polar bears are actually doing on the ice. Um, movement is difficult, like doing GPS analysis, cluster analysis is difficult because they're on, often on a moving platform of ice. Uh, so seeing how that moves and it's dynamic and changing. Um, but if we can know, for example, identify killing events or predation events through accelerometer data, and then they're subsequently observed at some time point after that, uh, then we might be able to start pulling those, those relationships out. But right now we, we don't have it. As far as for body condition, um, what was the other part there was? What was the other part of that question? Um, okay. Yeah, very abundant. It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we definitely think, so these, these studies, for example, the McClintock Channel, Gulf of Boothia, these, the studies were done in the spring. And as we found their, their body condition improved if they were sampled later in the survey season, and we really think that's simply a function of, of having access to prey for uh, a longer period of time, that seal pupping season. And there are some papers that, yeah, look at the seasonal body condition of polar bears. It does really change seasonally. There's been some um, work by uh, Melissa and Greg team in, uh, doing fat adipose tissue, being able to look at some of the samples that our hunters provide uh, so that we can get a, a seasonal look if we can use those samples to see how body condition changes over the year. But as far as whether rhythmicity itself relates to body condition, no, yeah, no, no idea. And, and it's, 
it's interesting to me, I just don't under, I don't know the mechanisms, like why a bear that's not disturbed by roads, humans, why she would switch to nocturnal, diurnal, then become completely arrhythmic all in the same year. So this is not a, a lot of animals don't do that. Like even when you think about humans, we don't really do that. And so it's kind of, it's interesting. So I don't, yeah, thanks. Next question uh, is uh, for Amy, and it's uh, from Andrea Corradini in Italy, and he's saying a very fascinating work, and he, his question is, do wolves that share the landscape with brown or grizzly bears have bigger home ranges as a result of, of competition, uh, even seasonally? Um, yeah, that is a very good question. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know the answer to that for sure. And I'm not sure it's necessarily been looked into. The thing about wolf home range size is that it's driven by a bunch of different factors. Um, so it can be driven by resource availability, right? Um, which is affected also by bears and whether bears are usurping resources on the landscape. Um, but it's driven by resource availability, uh, landscape characteristics, and in particular, um, wolf density. So intraterritorial conflict plays a big part in wolf home range. And then I assume competition with scavengers and stuff like that could as well. Um, you know, Andres Ortiz did a, a paper that showed out of Scandinavia um, that bear, uh, wolves were kind of less likely to establish in bear areas. Um, so I know that information exists. So wolf, wolf pair establishment kind of was like less likely to happen in higher bear density areas in, in Scandinavia as the wolf population recovered. Um, but it's a good question and actually it would be a fun thing to look into. Next question is for Jenny, and I think there's a couple of comments that are kind of related, but Karen Noyce asked, um, how did you quantify relatedness? Uh, did you only include litter mates, uh, siblings, but not litter mates, or siblings of the mother, grandmother, etc.? Okay, that's a good question. Um, we actually used um, microsatellite genotyping, and we got the lynch ritland uh, pairwise relatedness for these females, and we have a huge amount of data. Uh, we're really spoiled in this project. Um, and so we first defined relatedness as 0.25, which included everything up to grandmothers. Um, but then during peer review, they suggested that we lower it and include even more distantly related individuals. So we ended up going all the way down to 0.15 or 0.125, which um, included things uh, like second cousins even. So um, yeah, we, we tried to include as many related females as we could um, in the study. Um, let's see, it's a question for John. Um, were deer more likely to be scavenged to serve by black bears? Why would horses be a better alternative for cougar, cougars living in a, in a bear area? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, you know, first of all, I would say we were quite surprised to find cougars preying on uh, horses to begin with at the level that they were. There was quite a there's some anecdotal evidence of cougars uh, uh, preying on horses, but that's that's a pretty big prey item um, where you know it can reach 400 kilograms, and we've got both uh, male and female cougars preying on that. One of the things that we saw is that there's a little bit of switching. Obviously, I only talked about the data set that's during the bear active season. What we see is that males tend to take advantage of uh, horses when the foals are on the ground and in spring and early summer during the bear active season. Um, and then during the winter, what we tend to see is that the females start to take advantage more of the horses. And so females are taking, over time, they're taking advantage of horses, I think, uh, more during the bear inactive season for females, but they are during the bear active season at some level. And I think it becomes a little bit of a function of availability. Um, horses are, are tremendously increasing the, you know, we're, we're over BLM target, uh, population targets. Um, there's now about 45,000 uh, feral horses in the Great Basin. Um, and so it's, it's becoming a, a, an opportunistic thing um, where they do lose the kill um, to bears, but it's, there's quite a bit of a re risk and re reward. And it's, it, it's hard to disentangle some of these questions because it's, it, it was a little counterintuitive to us that, you know, if you're going to lose these prey items, um, you know, why would you spend time on some of these more, uh, uh, 
you know, risky um, uh, prey items. But I, I think some of this is still settling out as bears come back too. I think we're seeing the system in flex and we probably haven't leveled off exactly where we're gonna uh, be in the system in terms of the proportion of deer uh, taken and the proportion of horses. So I know that's not really a good answer, but the system's in flex and some of this is uh, definitely counterintuitive. Yeah, and I think in, by that answer, I think you also partially answered uh, Mike McDaniel's question uh, regarding, uh, he asked about uh, whether the density of feral horses in Stoia increased over that time period, and it sounds like it did. Yeah, and, I, and, and there's been, you know, some actual discussion about, you know, how, how to manage horses through uh, uh, natural processes and, and predation, and, you know, it our take home is, is that yes, cougars will prey on uh, uh, horses, but probably not at the level to be a top-down regulating mechanism. Next question is uh, for Amy, it's from uh, Anna Hertel. Um, you mentioned that black bears co-occur in Yellowstone. Could you speculate a bit on how black bears and also coyotes modulate your interference and exploitation relationships uh, in comparison to, to Sweden? Uh, are there any future plans to extend your study? Um, yeah, also uh, another good question. There are black bears um, in Yellowstone, there are coyotes, um, and both of them tend to be less adept at stealing um, or usurping wolf kills. Um, you know, it's not, it's, I don't know that it's not ever happened, but it's pretty rare that a black bear is able to come in and steal wolf kill. Um, that being said, black bears hammer neonate ungulates just like grizzly bears do. Um, so I'm sure that uh, they affect exploitation competition in Yellowstone, um, just because there are, there's just more bears present on the landscape in Yellowstone compared to Scandinavia, both brown bears and black bears. Um, and uh, that could be one of the reasons why we see you know, speculating here, but one of the reasons why we see more even predation um, in Yellowstone during summer uh, in Scandinavia, I mean, they are, the wolves are focused on neonate calves. It's like 90% of their diet. And in Yellowstone, it's like 50, right? Um, so they're 50% neonates and they're off killing other animals as they would otherwise. And that could be just because there are fewer around. Um, it could also be because they have much larger pack sizes. And so you have to feed more mouths. Um, so there's a lot of things that are kind of intertwined there. Um, and in terms of interference competition, you know, wolves may have to spend more time dealing with scavengers, um, and they certainly lose food biomass to scavengers, whether they're ravens or decomposers in the soil. Um, so I assume that that would be a thing, but I'm not sure that uh, black bears play a huge piece in the interference competition um, part of things. And I guess in terms of future directions. Um, it's a good question. There, we have lots of good questions um, to ask about this stuff. It's just a matter of how you how do you tease this kind of thing apart? I mean, these variables are very coarse, right? It's bare presence in an area versus not bare presence in an area. So um, kind of more like what John's looking at, what's going on at the carcass site? What are those feeding rates and how are those affected? And that just requires such a massive effort. So, um, you know, uh, the home range thing is another nice idea. What do those look like? But um, lots of possible directions. It just depends on what we can make happen. Okay. Next question is for Jenny, it's from Cecily Costello. And she's asking, uh, you indicated as many as 40% question mark of females disperse long distances, but your results indicated a strong relationship of maternal overlap. Um, did you have to exclude some long distance dispersers due to lack of data about their neighboring females? That's a good question. Um, so as yes, uh, first I wanna clarify that um, while up to 40% of females may disperse, they're not all long distance dispersers. So we have a lot of shorter distance dispersal dispersers in there that are considered dispersers because they're no longer adjacent or overlapping their natal range. Um, but as far as females to exclude, there were females that were excluded from the study because if a female didn't overlap any other females, there was no social variables that we could extract from her. So um, that was just part of the screening process when we got down to those 56 females that we were able to have the amount of data that we needed that overlapped females that weren't somewhere way way off where we didn't know what was going on over there. So it was all part of the screening process to make sure that we we were getting solid data. We were able to get these social variables that made sense and, and we could compare like with like. 
Next question is for, for Jasmine. It's from Russ Van Horn. Um, fascinating presentation on rhythms and lack of rhythms in female polar bears. What's behind the shift in peak rhythmic behavior to midnight during the seal puffing season? Uh, prey behavior differences in sensory abilities or question mark? Yes, thanks Russ, big question mark. Uh, mm. Really interesting. I, short answer is we don't actually know. Uh, this again, like, like Amy was saying, is a lot of course, course measurements that we have. And in fact, our prey variable was just kind of prime feeding season, which we designated as three months that we know seal puppings high. Now, the, the thing that I wonder about or that I was thinking about would be nice to, to look at is that these animals are, everyone's under 24 hours of, of light. And there have been some studies on kind of um, sunning behavior, kind of the uh, course looks at seal uh, diurnality or rhythms. And they, from what I remember, they do tend to be diurnal. Um, now, what does that mean in the, in the, in the terms of a 24 hour light? I don't know. And I think about temperature, the, the sun does change, intensity of light does change. I mean, the, obviously the earth is still rotating, so there's changes. And I just wonder if, um, if, the, if the pups are sitting out there on the ice and uh, as it gets warmer, maybe the later parts of the day, like we think of later, 4 p.m., 6 p.m., is that warmer? So then the bears have a better chance of getting them because the seals are actually out there, the pups, in that warmer part of the day, even though we don't have discrete day-night cues. That's just me like just trying to think. Um, but honestly, we don't really know. And the question, some bears become arrhythmic during this time period, that I can kind of think through that a little bit easier in that they are just going and foraging and searching and going after pup after pup for food resource after food resource. But the switch, it's a really good question and there's something going on. And then again, not every bear does it. So <laughs> why some, not the others? Um, is she learning social? Is she learning from her mother? What did her mother do and why? So that's been some of the talk too. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of questions come from, from this and I'm hoping um, that with more fine resolution data with the accelerometer work, that some of this starts to, to piece out. It's, it's hard with polar bears, it's hard to do a site visit, really hard. So I don't know how long it'll be till we get there for them, but try. And Jasmine, while we're, we're talking about your study still, there's also a question uh, regarding the accel accelerometers and whether the, the, the measurements in the X, Y, and Z axes uh, are, are more accurate than, than a typical GPS caller. You might, you might reflect on that. Sure, yes. The, so the accelerometers in these, uh, these were Talonix callers. And the accelerometers on board are, they do, they do gather the information on the X, Y, and Z axis, uh, but Talonix, there's a proprietary like, algorithm in which they sum those axes, filter the data, and then they give you a number out. Um, previous work I didn't, I didn't talk about, but we did do um, kind of ground truthing with what are those, those numbers that come off of a Talonix accelerometer collar, fitted collar, how does that actually relate to what a bear is doing? We use captive polar bears in uh, zoos and some brown bears. Now, a lot of what people are doing is they're taking that raw XYZ off the, the accelerometer itself and, and looking at that. That is much finer. You're going to get a lot more information for sure, 100%. Thanks. We're, we, we've certainly dealt with similar issues in our studies. Um, next question is uh, from Garth Moet for Amy. Um, if wolves do not kill more often in the presence of bears, is food intake lower for the wolf population in the long term? Or is it possible that their prey are so large that they effectively eat as much food in short abouts at the kill? Um, well, that's kind of the, that's kind of the ultimate question is, you know, what does, I mean, so wolves may not have like spend as much time handling carcasses and how does that translate into food biomass acquisition and energetic condition, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know. Um, you know, there are, um, 
like I said, once again, these are coarse variables looking what we were happening. Uh, I know there are studies out of Africa, I think on wild dog and cheetah that show that, I mean, scavengers uh, do affect their energetic budget. Right, so um, on some level, scavenging affects the energetic budget of the animals that make the prey. Um, to what extent, how, you know, but to what extent that that happens, whether that affects their population dynamics or immediate nutritional status, um, I think is 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 uh, an important question, and it might also depend on the time of year too. I mean, it could be worse. Wolves tend to be at least in Yellowstone; they tend to be more food limited during summer. Um, so those uh, bears coming in and stealing kills um, and and kind of taking neonate calves during summer um, could be worse in in that time of year, right? So it's a good question, and it's one that needs to be answered. It reminds me; uh, I had a question uh, for for you, John. Um, you, you mentioned kleptoparasitism that you really couldn't look at it. What's, um, are there any opportunities or how would you envision in the future looking at, at that aspect? Yeah, so that's a really good question, Frank. We actually tried to look at it with uh, trail cameras at kill sites. Once we had uh, real-time data, we'd go out and put a camera trap up there. And we also were trying to use uh, these proximity collars from uh, Vectronics, where we set them up for where uh, when a bear and a cougar within 200 meters, the two collars would link up and collect data at, at the same time. And we collected every second because we knew these interactions may be really quick. And we actually have some data from that that shows that these, you know, the, the behavior of cougars after they're kicked off and kind of uh, making uh, circles around before they uh, abandon the, the kill site, but our uh, sample sizes just weren't large enough to really address the question. So I think it's a matter of time and resources, but I think that's how we would proceed trying to uh, answer that question. Let's see, still have a bunch of good questions. Um, uh, Question from Sterling Miller for Amy, again, uh, a bear can eat a moose calf very quickly, you know, very short time period, 15, 45 minutes. Um, adult ungulate kills by wolves persist longer, even with multiple wolves on a kill. Therefore, greater potential, is there greater potential for bears to find wolf kills than reverse? Uh, is that a consideration in your work? Um, yeah, I mean, 100%. Uh, there's certainly greater potential for bear Bleh, greater potential for bears to find wolf kills um, than reverse. Um, and it also explains why kind of we didn't really see much for interference competition uh, during summer in Scandinavia when wolves were really preying on those neonate smaller prey packages also, right? So um, that kind of works both ways. When either one of these are specializing in, either one of these animals are specializing in these small neonate prey packages, I think the potential for interference competition just generally decreases. Um, I think if that answers that question, yeah. Another question from uh, Russ Van Horn. This is for, for Jenny. Um, behavior reflects uh, kin recognition when individuals benefit from discriminating kin from non-kin and then altering their behavior. Might females discriminate, discriminate kin from non-kin but do not benefit from them, so do not alter their behavior? Intriguing <laughs> question. <laughs> Russ, that's, a, that's difficult. Um, yeah, so uh, we spent a fair amount of time trying to figure out why familiarity and not kinship. Um, and uh, Part of the rabbit hole I went down with in trying to figure this out was uh, finding uh, finding out things like cryptic kin recognition and things like in highly philopatric societies or highly philopatric uh, species that are typically philopatric, like brown bears typically are. I know our population is a little bit different, um, but you can almost assume that your neighbor is related to you. And so in this way, you don't necessarily need to know that's my kin, just that they're near me, so probably related. And as long as our genes keep getting passed down, that's the benefit. Um, what makes it really interesting in this population is that because of the continued removal of females due to hunting, these spaces are constantly getting filled in by females that are not related at all. And so it really kind of like screws it up. So it's like um, your neighbor may or may not be related to you. You may or may not get a, a benefit being kin, but the familiarity might help. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's really tricky, 
And I, I wish I had a better answer for your question, but it's, um, it's a complicated bit of business there. Uh, another question for Amy, this is from John Draper, and I think it's a good question um, about you know, the management implications. I'm just summarizing his, his questions into what are the potential management implications from your work? Um, yeah, I, I saw that question pop up and, and the potential management implications. Um, I'm probably going to give a pretty hard politician answer here. Uh, it depends on what your management goals are. <laughs> um, are your management goals that of Yellowstone National Park to have an intact ecosystem? Or are they to decrease depredations on livestock, right? I mean, even if you can say, well, wolves kill less in the presence of brown bears. So we should have both wolves and brown bears in your cattle livestock area. Won't that be great? That's not going to help increase you know, love of wolves or, or tolerance for wolves. So I really think it depends on, like I said, what your kind of management implications are. Um, and I know that's kind of a, a lame answer, uh, but, I, but I think it's true. Um, I don't know if there's more to that or if you have any kind of follow-up. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, that's uh, obviously management objectives would be a big, big part of that consideration. Um, let's see, uh, John, was someone asked, uh, Tanya Lewis asked, uh, was there any evidence of cougars preying on uh, younger black bears or, or vice versa? Uh, we had, a, we did have a bears uh, killing a couple of younger cougars, but we did not have the reverse um, that we detected. Doesn't obviously mean that's not happening in the system, but we didn't detect that. You know, one thing I would ask, and you know, I hopefully not stepping too much out of term, but you know, one of the things that I had a question for Amy that was of interest to me is that, um, you know, one of the things that we've asked is that are cougars being present in the Great Basin actually helping facilitate recovery and recolonization of black bears by providing a food resource that historically wouldn't have been on the landscape. One, because cougars were not in the system and two, horses weren't really on the system. And so I'm just uh, curious if you have any thoughts of if uh, wolves could facilitate uh, brown bear or grizzly bear uh, uh, expansion and facilitate recolonization or if that's um, something that you, you've thought about in the system. I mean, that makes 100% uh, sense to me, right? I mean, any kind of uh, predator that you have that's dropping biomass in the landscape and then isn't able to defend it very well um, would help facilitate the animal that can come in and take it from them. And particularly, as you say, this kind of horse population has increased dramatically. Um, it feels like that would surely be facilitating the kind of recovery and recolonization of black bears in your area and maybe twofold, right? So um, they kind of interact together. Cougars might've done it on their own, wild horses being in the landscape might've done it on their own, but now that they're both there and there are more horses dropping than there otherwise would have been, it seems like that would come together to um, generally be beneficial to the black bear population. One thing I'd, um... That I wanted to bring up as you know, it's kind of a for all of you to consider is, you know, what, what I find amazing is that uh, in, in all all your findings, um, you're really showing a tremendous amount of, of individual variation. Uh, and other studies on this work that you presented earlier has shown that too. Um, there's there's a lot more uh, social behavior to these animals than than I think we previously assumed. Um, just kind of curious what, what your perspectives are for, you know, where, where we should be heading with, with some of this work in the future. I was really intrigued, Jasmine, with, with, uh, with even the individual differences uh, in, in, the, in the patterns that you observed. Uh, I think that the same is true for, for you know, the other studies that you reported on as well. I'm just kind of curious about, um, about your perspectives of, of um, what what arenas of research would be would be useful for us to pursue in the future and, and with regard to to your topics well, this is more of a, a philosophical part of the, yeah. the, the, the discussion and the moderation um i i had a response until you said what research should we do next? Because I was thinking about what are the implications of the findings thus far in the context of, for example, I'll put it into polar bear 
And we have a lot, a lot of scrutiny, a lot of international eyes. Uh, and we're hearing that this is the way it's gonna go. Everything's gonna happen. And I think Karen Rhodes' talk, um, Anna's talk for Scandinavia and the brown bears, that these animals, they seem to be Oh, I think your internet is, you're stalling. We'll give you a couple of seconds to catch up. Give me a thumbs up if you can see me. Yeah, we are good okay. now. You um, might have to repeat what you just said. Sure. Uh, I was just thinking in terms of, of taking this in the polar bear context of um, a lot of this scrutiny, we have an idea or there's thoughts about what may happen, but this sort of behavioral flexibility and ad adaptation to what we don't know, like we don't know what they're seeing on the landscape. I don't know why these bears are switching. Uh, perhaps it is a change in ice at that finest scale. When the ice becomes dynamic, they go searching, moving. It's time to become arrhythmic because a lead has opened up and they've got a better chance of getting some sort of uh, food resource. We don't know, but what it shows is that as the environment changes around them, they have, it appears, an ability to be quite flexible with that. This is different than other species. You know, this is different for, say, a strictly uh, nocturnal prey species that if they become day active, fitness, it's not do it's not working for them. Mm -hmm. So uh, now where do we go to try to start tying that together, some of those questions and, and what we're seeing? Uh, I think it's going to be there's work Anthony Pagano's doing with the accelerometers, putting cameras on these collared bears. But in our areas, there's a lot of resistance to handling and collaring huge. And so it's, it's gonna take some thinking on how we really uh, get more information on what's actually happening. And I think what Karen Rode talked about focusing on the prey, on the seals, on whatever's there in those ecosystems is also huge. You guys all talked about it, but it's not really been done a lot in polar bear there's not a lot known about the dynamics of the prey. So that's a focus I think we should, should move toward. More system studies, in, in other words. Yeah, the, the, when John talked about these two collars talking to each other, woo! Now, <laughs> we, we can't get a transmitter and a collar on a polar bear, a transmitter on a seal and a collar on a polar bear. It's not gonna happen, but still, just that that's really interesting to me. So yeah, getting more prey involved for polar bear at least would I think be huge. Yeah, and I, I would echo that, you know, and just a quick comment on the technology. The technology worked great. It wasn't a limitation of that. It was a limitation of sample size and having enough funds and uh, human capital to be able to, you know, collar enough individuals. And so I, I think there's a lot of promise with that. But whether we're actually going to be able to functionally do it or not is, is the, the question. You know, I think it would work in smaller systems and in contained uh, environments. But it, it was definitely something I think is worth looking into further. Amy or Jenny, any any final comments? I would just sort of piggyback off of that and like considering a solitary species that maybe is more social than we think it is, that sort of technology would be so helpful uh, because I work with typically hourly GPS points and you can kind of get a sense if two females are kind of, I don't know, within a, a half a kilometer of each other or something, but it would be amazing to see, you know, how close they really come to each other, how often they come towards each other and to get a better picture of, yeah, what, what is the social scene here? And that's exactly the kind of technology, but of course it is incredibly expensive and difficult. So it's, you know, lovely in the future. I hope it happens. <laughs> I would, I would parrot those same words. I mean, it'd be really cool to, to stick some proximity collars on wolves and bears and see what happens, right? And look at that energy. Cause we, we don't know a lot about what happens that immediately around those carcasses. Um, how are they behaving? And that'd be such cool stuff, but man, it costs a lot of money and it, the sample size is hard to get cause you gotta wait cause they don't always do it, right? So it's, um, it's a lot of investment to get back that information but hopefully one day. Well, thanks, uh, thanks everyone. I want to, uh, this is some wonderful perspectives and uh, hopefully stimulates some, some further ideas in, with our audience. Um, thank you so much to all the presenters for this excellent session. This was uh, really enjoyable and I hope that the audience thinks the same. And uh, we will have a short 15 minute break now um, before we get to our closing of the conference. Um, so please everyone hang on.
and um, good to good to see you all and um, hope to hope to see everyone soon in in person for the next conference thank you very much <laughs>